Hi, my name is Mark. I'm here from Boston University. Um, I know very little about reinforcement learning, as you will shortly know, uh, as you will shortly learn. However, I know kind of a lot about time, both in terms of its psychology and its neuroscience. Um, and I've been giving a lot of thought to how this might, in the future, uh, contribute to reinforcement learning. So I'm delighted to have uh, the beginnings of a dialogue here. Um, so hooray. Um, so uh, let's take a moment and just sort of observe how um, the passage of time feels to us. Uh, so if I say A, B, and I do it again, I go A, B, uh, what's happening in that moment in between? So uh, many of us uh, might explain that what happens as the A recedes into the past is that we have almost a physical sense of A going, becoming more distant from us, uh, more distant from the present. And at the same time, uh, B uh, steadily comes uh, closer to us. Uh, let's do it again, uh, A, B. And there it was. So at each moment uh, in time, uh, it, we have a sense of a past uh, that uh, uh, follows us and a future uh, that reaches out uh, in front of us. Um, and uh, my thought experiment hopefully is enough to convince you. We didn't do any extensive learning. We didn't do a thousand trials of that experiment, right? We have this uh, spontaneous experience of the passage of time. Uh, we've also done very careful experiments in the laboratory in which we train people uh, to answer questions about uh, their memory uh, and about their anticipation of the future. This is kind of a complicated slide. Uh, let me just uh, show you uh, on the left here, uh, this is a, a standard uh, a, a experimental paradigm called judgment of recency. We ask people to judge the occasion of two events uh, that happened in the past. And we've known for like 40 years um, that the way people uh, answer this task is as if what they're doing is uh, doing like a trace and galat visual search only in time over their past and they stop when they find the first target they're looking for. Uh, we did a variant of that experiment in which we gave them a predictable future with consistent sequences. And all you really need to do to appreciate the point I'm trying to make is notice that these two pictures look sort of mirror symmetric to one another. So to the extent we accept that we can scan across some record of the past uh, that leads up to us, which we as cognitive psychologists have believed for 40 years, you so too uh, can also examine uh, the future. So um, the structure of my talk today um, is I'm going to uh, tell you about sort of three categories of things. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, talk to you about a whole bunch of uh, work that uh, me and my colleagues and many, many other people have done uh, over the last decade or so. Uh, we've learned a ton about how the brain represents the past. This temporal memory is now something we know a great deal about. Uh, I'm going to summarize that literature really quickly for you. Perhaps uh, this will be of interest. Uh, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to explain some very recent work uh, that my colleagues and I have done, uh, have taken to sort of explore, exploit things we've learned about how the brain represents time uh, and incorporating that into deep networks. Um, and we find uh, really surprisingly amazing stuff from really simple algorithms. Okay? Uh, and I'll tell you about that. Uh, and then this last part of the uh, talk, and if we run out of time and I have to uh, skip it, that's probably not the worst thing in the world. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some half-formed ideas uh, about how uh, we and the brain uh, and perhaps future RL algorithms might uh, construct an estimate of the future uh, uh, as, it, as B uh, comes closer to us. All right, so uh, since about, um, for about the last 10 years or so, uh, my lab has been working really hard on trying to figure out um, the following problem. Uh, under the assumption that what we have in our noggins as, we, as something recedes into the past is that we carry along with us um, uh, sort of a compressed temporal memory of what happened when. And this is available to us all the time. Uh, and that we use that representation to do various uh, memory tasks like uh, judgment of recency or episodic memory tasks. Uh, and that this is something that we could in principle uh, peek in on the brain and observe. And the basic idea, and I'll, I'll show you some equations later, but the, the basic idea is that there's a record of what happened when, uh, what corresponding to something like the lines on the staff of a musical score and when uh, referring to something like the left right distance. And as time unfolds that we're at, as we're at a moment T in objective time, the objective past is some function f sub t of tau, where tau is this, uh, this gone past, this no longer available past. Now, what we do in our brain at this moment now is create a record kind of like a, um, a musical score uh, of what, uh, what 
led up to us. So I'm gonna show you some evidence that the brain does this, uh, that does something very much like this. Um, and I'm gonna try and make three points to you. Uh, first, that um, there is this temporal, there is a record of what happened when in much, if uh, many, 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 many brain regions, right? Uh, second, that the, the, the timeline is not veridical. The timeline is not constant. The timeline has a very specific form to it. Uh, and that is logarithmically compressed as one uh, who has, if you followed psychology for the last 50 years, you're probably not surprised to learn that. Uh, but we're, we now know that is true in the brain as well. Um, and finally, um, there seem to be two forms of uh, temporal representation. And uh, one of them uh, is identifiable as uh, the real Laplace transform of the past. And I think this ends up being really profoundly important. Okay, um, so this is a sort of a summary slide describing dozens and dozens and dozens of papers. Um, in, many, in the hippocampus and many other brain regions, um, there are cells that fire after something interesting happens, A. And in that time, after something interesting happens, these cells fire in a reliable sequence, not unlike the microstates uh, that, uh, uh, that Elliot and, uh, and Rich worked on, right? Um, and I'm showing you here, uh, I've chosen uh, uh, you know, a variety uh, of uh, experiments, but there's this sort of characteristic curvature to them when you plot them uh, as a function of time. Um, and there's this spread that, uh, uh, spread that takes uh, place. So this cell here fires early, this one fires later, this one fires yet later, and you'll notice that the receptive fields get wider and wider uh, as a function of time. Um, there's now been reports from, I think, probably eight or nine brain regions. Um, we I personally have done you know, maybe a dozen papers on medial prefrontal cortex uh, and um, hippocampus and sub uh, CA3 and CA1, uh, and many, many other people have uh, done uh, stuff along these lines. A beautiful paper last year from Alana Witten's lab uh, showing sequences in um, the striatum that go to the nuclear accumbens for those of you who are interested uh, in our cell stuff. So this is all over the place. Um, I, I wanna show you uh, evidence that, so that's the, the sort of uh, horizontal extent of the, uh, of the score, right? As a, something happens, it recedes into the past, we can decode how long ago it was by seeing which cells are firing. We can also decode which stimulus uh, started uh, the delay. Um, there's, uh, again, a number of papers here. This is one from my lab, um, uh, uh, recording, uh, using recordings from Earl Miller's lab in a monkey uh, delay matches sample task. Uh, the monkey is presented with one of two stimuli, cats or dogs. Um, and we can decode not only what stimulus, uh, we can not only decode when that uh, uh, cat or dog was presented, but also which uh, item it was because the different stimuli trigger different sequences like the lines on a uh, musical staff. And there, there's, there's now many, 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 many papers making this point. Okay. Um, the remembered past is not veridical, right? There is not equal resolution for equal points on the line. Okay, we're positive of that, but to the extent you accept that those curves are curved, right, and not a straight line, if it was a veridical representation of the past, you would have seen the same number of cells per unit time and the sequence would have been linear. We're sure that isn't the case. Um, we are also uh, now in our lab increasingly convinced that the form uh, is the way it should be, right? <laughs> uh, that it's a logarithmic compression. And there's some very strong theoretical reasons to expect that's a good thing for the brain to do. Um, and uh, we've uh, now sort of uh, uh, done uh, some very careful analysis. Ray, uh, Ray Tao and uh, Jay Bladen uh, have shown this, that probably the, rather than showing you all the statistics and everything, probably the most compelling thing I can do to convince you of this is to take this sequence of time cells recorded from the rodent hippocampus uh, and just plot them as a function of log time, right? And to the, in, to the extent you accept that as a straight line, Right? And we can uh, you know, assess that statistically. You, you believe that I've found the, the transformation that undoes that curvature, right? Uh, and it's log time. And then, please read the paper. It, it's much more careful than that, right? Uh, sure. Uh, the y-axis is cell number sorted on their peak time. So there's a subset of cells that fire. We take all the ones that fire. They need not be, and we just sort them on when they fire. So we're looking at the sequence. Uh, we don't know that there's any anatomical organization or anything like that, certainly not on the hippocampus, but um, okay. So uh, this log scale is theoretically really satisfying. This is aesthetically pleasing because we know that the brain does this all over the place, right? We know that the distribution of receptors across your retina as a function of peripheral distance goes down like log uh, function. Uh, we know there's Weber Fechner law from the 19th century, right? Uh, we, we know that the nonverbal number system, the number system that you use if you're not counting, 
uh, is uh, uh, logarithmically compressed. And so this, it seems really natural and good that time uh, also behaves like this, yeah. Um, it's a, that's a more complicated question. The issue is that um, there's variability across trials uh, as well. Um, I'd refer you to the paper. Um, and um, we, we, we're, we cannot rule out the hypothesis that the spread is also scalar, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we tested that really closely. We're not, we're about as sure as we could be from this data set, but it's possible someone else records some more elaborate data set. I didn't see you had their hand up first. Yeah. Let, let, let's, let's circle back to this, right? The, the why of this, I, I have a whole bunch of other observations to tell you about before we get to the why. We've, we've given a lot of thought to why and, um, but yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. These are, okay, so we don't know what happens to time cells along the dorsal ventral axis. No one's done the recording. All the recordings I showed you uh, thus far from the hippocampus are from dorsal CA1. Um, and as far as we're aware, dorsal CA1 and dorsal CA3 all have this spectrum, right? It is not the case. So this, this you drop a tetrod in, right, into a lump of tissue and you see all time constants, right? You even see time constants much longer than a few seconds, right? You, we don't know what the upper limit of that sequence is. Uh, you know, I have a student who uh, convinced ourselves from calcium recordings that the sequences go on for like five minutes, right? Um, so these are open empirical questions, uh, but we, do, we, we don't know what happens across the dorsal ventral axis. Um, actually, really interesting point, um, since you brought it up, um, to the extent we, uh, to the extent people have measured, um, there's discrete structure of grid cell spatial frequency. However, the ratio of grid uh, scales one to the other is constant, which puts them in a geometric series, which also makes them on like a discrete logarithmic scale. Right. So one way to one thing that might turn out from all this is that there's and we'll come back to this after I show you the deep networks. We do have to move on. I have so much cool stuff to tell you. Um, uh, but, you know, one possibility is that there's many log scales with bin different beginnings and ends. And there's sort of this discrete uh, structure between them. And that's sort of the hypothesis I favor right now. But it's an open empirical question uh, here. Let me let me go back. The, 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 I've got so much more cool stuff. If you like this boy, howdy. Uh, you just hang on. So this is, okay, so this is of obvious benefit, right, to the brain. The fact that here I've drawn uh, some two functions, uh, one's a temporal rescaling of the other, uh, and I've put them as a function of time and then as a function of log time. And you'll note that uh, looking, uh, if you have a log time axis, rescaling just amounts to a translation. You can accept that to the extent you note that those, the red and the blue functions on the log axis are just slid along. This turns out to be profoundly important. Uh, for deep learning uh, models and for facing a world where you need not choose a time step. It means that if you fail to correctly choose your time step, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, if the brain has chosen a different time step, then uh, the world has, uh, you're in, uh, you're okay. Um, I don't wanna go too much into the uh, equations here, but I wanna say that uh, starting in about 2009 and, and there's this really uh, sort of put together paper in 2013 um, my postdoc, my former postdoc, uh, Kartik Shankar, and I thought really closely about how one could build out these uh, representations uh, prior to observing most of the data, actually. Um, and the only thing we could think of that would have this scale invariant property that would be a sensible model was as follows, right? That you'd have two populations of neurons. You'd have a population uh, that's uh, like unto time cells, uh, which we're writing here as F tilde of tau star with these cells that tile the time axis. The only way we could figure out to build that was to propose um, that uh, there was this other representation uh, which encodes the real Laplace transform of the recent past, just a bank of leaky integrators with a spectrum of S with a continuous set of values of real uh, S, real Laplace transform. And then you could somehow invert the Laplace transform uh, approximate inverting the Laplace transform and get out these things that look like time cells, right? And this seemed kind of kooky bananas, um, but 
uh, here's what it would look like uh, if we had both of those forms of representations. Uh, and <laughs> that's a good answer to this. Okay, so the F tilde representation that approximates the inverse Laplace transform fires in sequence. And so when you plot it in this way we've been looking at, you see this characteristic curvature and uh, you'll note it has uh, sort of the right shape. Okay. In addition, there should be this other population that's triggered when A happens, right? Um, and then all of the cells are triggered when A happens and then decay at different rates, different real, uh, different real S. And that population should look as follows, okay? Uh, they should all uh, turn, off, uh, turn on and then turn off, but gradually at different rates. And it turns out you can map the continuous axis of S to the continuous axis of time Knowing that this is the real Laplace transform, you know that it can be done and that there's a linear operator that gets you from here to there, okay? Uh, and, and we can read the papers, we can go offline. Okay, so for a long time, um, you know, we saw time cell, time cell, time cell, time cell, time cell, the sequence, 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 sequence. And I started to wonder if like maybe that whole Laplace thing was silly and there was some other way to construct it. Um, a couple of years ago, I was, at, um, I was at SFN and I saw a poster from Elizabeth Buffalo's lab um, and she showed a figure that looked kind of like uh, the following. Uh, it's a, uh, recordings from entorhinal cortex and uh, you show the monkey a picture and there's all these cells that perturb as soon as the picture uh, is uh, presented and then they relax back to their baseline firing rate at a variety, approximately exponentially, apparently at a variety of rates. Uh, here's what you looks like if you construct a heat map of it. And again, we did very careful analyses to estimate the time constants, demonstrate they're not the same and exponential is a reasonable thing. So something like 150, 200 milliseconds after the, after the image is presented on the screen, this whole population turns on and then turns off at different rates. Um, I should mention that around the same time, uh, Albert Sal working in the uh, Moser lab observed something similar in rodents uh, in a nature paper in 2018. Uh, so with a spectrum of time constants and exponential filters. Uh, so there's at least two papers now showing um, a spectrum of time constants uh, in entorhinal cortex uh, coding for the real Laplace transform of the past. Okay, so a couple of observations. Again, um, this is just a diagonal connectivity matrix. If you wanted to build a network that does that, you just need to put the right S's along the diagonal and away you go, right? You put the right numbers on the diagonal and uh, you can construct a network that does this. It's just a bank of leaky integrators. It's like a really stupid neural network. Um, and it seems like uh, it's in the noggin. Uh, second of all, we know how to get out those sort of supported logarithmically compressed uh, representations. It's just a linear transformation. Uh, we wrote down a really nice one that you can probably roll your own, uh, get something that works pretty well. Um, and um, one other point, something else I wanted to say. All right, forget it. Oh, yeah. And if you choose the rate constants in a geometric series, so too you will get the time constants, those tau stars, in a geometric series, and you will have both of them being log compressed um, in a satisfactory way. All right, so summing up what we know about time in the brain, there's lots and lots and lots of brain regions uh, that show um, this some sort of temporal information. Uh, I, I might go so far as to say kind of the whole brain uh, is paying attention to time, right? Um, there are, uh, there's a log compressed time axis in at least two, uh, in at least some experiments. Uh, and we've seen it in the hippocampus. Uh, other people have uh, seen it in the cerebellum actually, uh, in slice recordings of all things. Um, and uh, the absence of evidence might just mean people haven't looked at this closely enough yet. Um, and finally, there's uh, at, least, uh, at least two papers uh, showing exponential basis functions, exponential temporal basis functions uh, in entorhinal cortex. And again, I expect that as people go looking for this, they will uh, find this. People found time cells, like I, I wrote half a dozen time cell papers on previously published data where I said, you know, hey, I bet you there's time cells in there and they generously shared the data. And, and uh, I, I bet you there's also these ramps, these exponential ramps elsewhere. Okay, so um, let me talk about, uh, let me change gears a little bit and talk about um, what one gets if one tries to incorporate these ideas uh, into uh, deep neural networks, right? Um, and so first, uh, you know, one might ask yourself, well, why don't we just build an RNN, right? Um, uh, uh, lots of people have worked on RNNs for solving problems in deep learning and also computational neurosciences is like a, a reasonable thing. Um, and so we thought about it really closely and it turns out um, that if you require your RNN to have this property that it treats 
uh, time dilations as translation across its cells, that you get the same sequence, like this uh, picture I just made here. You want your RNN to treat time dilations as a translation. Uh, there's two very strong constraints, uh, and almost no RNNs will satisfy this constraint. The two constraints are the eigenvalues of the recurrent matrix have to be in a geometric series. The other constraint is the eigenvectors, and this is really the really impossible to defeat one, uh, have to be translated versions of one another. They have to tile uh, your uh, representation, right? Uh, which is extraordinarily restricted set of uh, 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 conditions. You'll note that a diagonal matrix satisfies that trivially. It's, it's, uh, it's the basis, it's eigenvectors are clearly translated uh, versions of one another. Um, and so too does a linear transformation of this diagonal matrix, okay? Um, so to heck with RNNs, let's not train an RNN. Let's do this. Let's assume that uh, the network has committed to this form of representation, okay? That every single layer, okay, we are gonna build a deep network and every single layer has log compressed representation of time, okay? The only thing, every single representation is what happened when, okay? However, different layers care about different what's, right? Uh, the what in your auditory cortex might not be the same as the what in, you know, some part of the brain that's attending to the meaning of what I'm saying or something like that. Um, and let's just have, uh, and seriously, this is the stupidest thing we could think of. Uh, let's just have a dense layer in between each, uh, each layer of this logarithmically compressed uh, network and let's uh, see what happens. Uh, and again, each layer is logarithmically compressed. The observed time constants you'd get from one layer to the next might be different because the what's that the network cares about are different, right? It takes a long time to say a word. It takes a shorter time to, you know, perturb a hair cell or something like that. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's the same thing. Um, I'm going to point you to the uh, NeurIPS paper uh, from last year. Uh, Brandon Jacks as the first author. I should mention um, I did this uh, I did almost nothing on this paper, actually. Uh, um, uh, uh, Zoran Tiganj uh, at Indiana University and Per Cedarberg uh, at University of Virginia did uh, like the real work. Uh, and I, I basically just clapped and put it in my talks. Uh, so the first answer is that this, um, the first result, and again, please read the paper, uh, is that this stupid network uh, just crushes RNNs and LSTMs on problems with long-term uh, dependency. So we do like the adding problem and every everything can learn it, you know, if the delay is like 50. Okay, now let's make the delay 500, let's make the delay 5,000, and this network doesn't care, right? It doesn't care because the solution at a rescaled uh, time version is just a translation of the one it already learned. It is equally able to learn all of those because they're the same as far as it's concerned because it hasn't chosen a characteristic time scale. Yeah. Uh, you, you, in, for practice, in practice, we did it that way because it turns out to be easy to compute. Uh, in real life, uh, you need not uh, do that. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a time. Notice that the Laplace transform is a time local um, uh, operator. Right. Uh, it doesn't need to know any history. It's just dx dt. Then there's no t on the right hand side. Okay. Um, finally, um, I'll, I'll mention that. Um, we don't have any problems with backpropagation through time because it's just a diagonal matrix in the middle and every time constant, okay? So there is, the gradient is nice for some of those time constants and uh, we have no problem with that whatsoever. And again, please read the paper. Um, I'm leaving out a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I'm leaving it out because there's something even cooler you can do with this, right? Um, so let's, uh, let's do a little thought experiment. Um, so uh, let's say we're doing audio MNIST. We trained the networks to do audio MNIST. Let's you and I uh, do audio MNIST together. So if I say three, you got it. Yeah, so I say, I say four, okay, also you can do it. Um, okay, watch this. Uh, hang on a second, this takes a second. Seven. Okay, which one was that? Ah, oh, you're tricking me. You did not think it was five. Uh, that was seven. Okay, for uh, okay. So I, I would wager. I tried. I tried to. I tried to say that ten times slower than I would expect you to ordinarily hear it. And I would wager you've never heard anyone say the word seven that silly in your life. And yet, nonetheless, everyone in the room, except for this one guy, <laughs> you know, is is able to identify uh, this this rescaled pattern. Okay. 
Um, and so basically, all we did was we took that stupid, stupid network I just showed you and just put a CNN with a max pool at each level, right? So it's now, uh, recall that convolutions are scale, are um, translation uh, covariant. Uh, the max pool makes it translation invariant. And I now have a scale invariant um, convolutional neural network. So we trained uh, this network and other stuff at scale 1.0, audio MNIST, you know, a couple of other problems, and it does okay at learning the... Uh, problems. It's these aren't hard problems. Um, but then we tested, we generalized the networks that were trained only on scale one to faster and slower scales. Um, and so lo and behold, uh, blue is the uh, scale invariant network. Uh, the, the, this, this one built with the log time, temporal memory, uh, you'll notice that its performance is constant over a factor of 10. Um, and actually the only reason it ever fails is that the convolution hits the edge of one of the layers, right? So <laughs> we don't actually, we can actually make it rescale as long as we want with the same weights, right? If we've trained it at all at one scale, we can just add bits without retraining the weights and just let the weights slide over larger and larger extents. And the, the scales you can go over goes up like exponentially with the number of units uh, you're willing to commit and doesn't depend at all on the number of weights you need to train. Okay, so that seems really uh, appealing. And in orange, you see a regular old uh, temporal convolution network uh, that, uh, you know, been pretty popular. Uh, and as you, as you might expect, it fails uh, rapidly as the scale changes. Uh, yeah. No, it, it, interestingly enough, it does differentiate. Um, it's, it ends up spitting out. Um, so the, the peak at which you find the match from the convolution is in different spots, right? Um, it, the, it's invariant, so it ends up saying, oh, that was a slow seven. Right? It, sorry, if you, if you interpret the location of the peak as the speed of the stimulus, it's telling you explicitly that was a slow seven or that was a fast seven. Um, it's integrate by integrating over them and passing on the output of the filters, uh, it is invariant in that sense. But it, the layer knows, every, every part of it knows what happened, right? All right, so to summarize this, oh, sorry. Hmm? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, as an experimentalist, having done cognitive psychology experiments, it's really difficult to build a scale invariant experiment because of exactly this. People have things to do. Uh, you know, they're not willing to wait. Uh, like I can make the network, uh, you know, listen to seven played over four hours. Okay, right, and it'll it'll perfect. There's no way on earth I can get a person to sit there for two hours, right, <laughs> listening to one word, right. Um, so yeah, I think these are really important empirical issues. Um, and I, as a cognitive psychologist, um, I think these are really important issues, right? But they're separate from, uh, as in, uh, it, sort of wearing my theorist hat, uh, it's a different hat than the let's get all the parameters right to describe human behavior. And I think both of those are really important jobs. Um, the equations don't care, right? Uh, people do, uh, figuring out how those equations, which apparently live, which one might accept have something to do with what's happening inside people, how those end up producing real world behavior is an important problem and I hope people work on it. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, great question. We don't know. Uh, we just did one word at a time. Uh, we'd love to scale this up. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it would depend on how the, I mean, the model might uh, recover from that. 
um, if the phonemes are themselves, uh, uh, if the subsets that it, each layer is passing on to the next one end up being well behaved. Uh, interesting question. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let me let me keep going. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there, there's lots of good stuff. Uh, yeah. You just took this idea of the work. I, I'm having trouble uh, deciding on the meaning of work uh, in order to uh, answer your question. Um, let, let's circle back to this. I'm, uh, I have, I still have really nice stuff yeah. to show you guys. Okay. Let's keep the rest of the yeah, yeah. Let's hang on to this. Yeah. Um, and I will say that. Um, uh, let me let me do like a couple more minutes here because uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. We're we're preloading the Q and A, but you guys don't know how much other stuff I'm going to tell you, right? Okay, so um, the last thing I want to say about this is you guys have mentioned a number of really awesome experiments. Okay, um, this is in Preset uh, ICML. Uh, there's GitHub um, for the Deep Sith. We're happy to make a GitHub for the uh, CNN. We'd be tickled pink um, if people other than us did these experiments. That would be fantastically wonderful. And we're happy to discuss and cooperate and help in any way we can. Um, this neurobiologically inspired replacement for RNNs and LSTMs raises a lot of questions. It has capabilities that we don't understand yet. Please, please, please help us figure out what those capabilities are. That would make us super happy, okay? Um, I'm gonna make a sort of a more extensive claim. Um, I claim, uh, we worked this out on the chalkboard. We haven't built it yet. I claim that one can use these same ideas to build a scale invariant um, uh, computer vision model that deals uh, with vision through time and space. So our eyes are never still, our retina is logarithmically compressed. Um, I claim that we can build a scale invariant vision model that rather than responding with the speed at which you said something, it'll give you the distance of the object you're viewing given some prior on its distribution. Uh, so in case anyone has $10 million, I have a thing to do with $10 million. All right. All right. So this, this workshop's about RL. And, um, you know, here my expertise will uh, uh, perhaps fail me. Um, but I want to make a couple of observations about RL and show you some experimental results that speak to sort of the thought process um, uh, we're going through. I, I'm thinking a lot about how to um, do conditioning. I think a lot about classical conditioning. I think a lot about RL, and I think a lot about predicting the future, okay, which is why I put the B thing in the first part of the talk. Okay, so traditional, uh, old fashioned, shall we say, uh, 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 original uh, RL models without microstates and all that uh, cool stuff um, have the property uh, that they're kind of atemporal. Right. The, the assumption of the Bellman equation is basically, if you think about it, that you're trying to estimate some weighted sum over a future, but the whole trick is to try and estimate that without actually experiencing a future. Right. Um, you, you want to uh, take some estimate of the value at each moment and sort of step backwards uh, in the classic TD learning, and you guys know this a million times better than me. But time wasn't built in uh, at the outset. Um, and um, so the, the sort of hypothesis I've been thinking about for quite some time now is what if and how, <laughs> what if we could estimate the future immediately, right? Well, A. Okay. What if we knew right as A is presented that B is far away and it's going to come closer and closer and closer? What would the algorithms look like if we started, if we knew how to do that, right? And then what would the algorithms, what would the RL-like algorithms look like if we started uh, from, that, uh, from that position? Um, and, um, you know, this goes back to a, a pretty old idea in psychology uh, that what you want to do in describing associations between CSs and USs uh, is try to understand the temporal informativeness of one stimulus about the other, right? And one way to operationalize that is one stimulus, how much does it change your predicted future for the other? To the extent it does, you've learned something. So the, the problem here boils down to how do we predict the future? How do we go A? How do we do that? Okay. Um, let me make a, a sort of um, perhaps obvious observation, but perhaps not. 
Um, first, I would say that the, there's a really close relationship between this. So first of all, Laplace transform codes for the function of how, what happened when, how long in the past, right? I've said that a bunch of times, okay? Um, let's notice that there's a sort of a pretty close relationship between eligibility trace and real Laplace transform in the recent past. The only real trick is that you, instead of having one lambda, or two lambdas or three lambdas, you just need a continuous set of lambdas. And those behave like the continuous set of time constants uh, that we had in Laplace transform. So that's a starting point. Um, as an aside, you can imagine also taking continuous parameters of anything that appears exponential. And uh, if you solve for something's effect on the world and you find it's exponential in that, well, you could treat it as a basis set and just uh, 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 drive through all possible values. Uh, Ida and I uh, wrote a paper noting that if you had a continuous set of gammas, you could play kind of a similar trick uh, with uh, exponential basis functions of Laplace transform of the future. Uh, but you could do the same thing with learning rate. I think this is why distributional RL works uh, as an aside. Um, or for getting rate and get some estimate of things that happened over trials. But let's just talk about eligibility trace and real Laplace transform of the past for today. Okay, so let's build a stupid associative model, right? Let's say that we have this Laplace transform of the past that I showed you is in the noggin and at least entorhinal cortex. And let's just say that all I do is I take each stimulus that happens now in the present and I associate it to the Laplace transform of the past. So if I present A and I wait some time uh, tau and I present B again, let's just associate B to A, uh, Laplace transform of A, A tau seconds in the past, just E minus S tau A, okay? Now let me cue this associative memory with rather than the Laplace transform right now. So, I, so I, I present the stimulus again, here comes A, and now it's receding into the past. Laplace transform during that time is E minus ST, uh, T being time since I presented A, uh, times the state A. Um, notice that if you let me take a reflection operator, taking the past into the future, I get E minus ST A, this is the reflection of the current past, I end up getting out something that's uh, E minus S tau minus T uh, times B. So I probe with Laplace transform of A uh, tau seconds in the past, and I get, as A recedes into the past, I get B tau minus T seconds uh, in the future. I have Laplace transform of B coming closer and closer and closer and closer to X, okay? So that's pretty cool. Um, and if you're paying real close attention here, you're getting really mad at me, because I just proposed that there's uh, increasing exponential firing rate uh, in the brain. And I agree that's a really bad idea. Um, and totally the brain shouldn't do that, okay? And yet, <laughs> um, here's an interval reproduction task, okay? Um, and so what happens in the interval reproduction task, and again, you don't need to do a million trials to learn this. I go A, B, and now you say those letters at that interval and try to match tau, and you can do it like in one trial. Um, so this is looking at the time after A prior to B, and it's a mouse and they're licking, but let, let's ignore all that, or they're, they're pressing a bar or something like that. If I had a population coding Laplace transform of the past, I would see that population going like E minus S tau, uh, sorry, E minus ST uh, as time recedes into the past. And just to remind you what that looks like in entorhinal cortex, okay? I'm showing you, um, uh, showing you that figure I showed you earlier. So these are some recordings um, from um, medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, the paper is on eLife. Um, and uh, the uh, reports from uh, uh, Kate Thurley's lab, uh, and I don't know really much anything about that, uh, but I had a student uh, take the data and just play around with it. Uh, and here's what we see when we sort it in the same way. When we do the, basically the analysis that let us sort it, uh, we did the same sorting we did in the internal cortex paper. We see one population as time goes by uh, that looks very much like entorhinal cortex over here. There's all the cells fire, all the cells in this population fire at the beginning of the delay, and then they turn off uh, with different time constants. And we're sure there's not a single time constant. There's a nice uh, tail to it. And now here's what the other population does while you're waiting for B, right? They ramp up, You'll to, again, to the extent you accept this is like a mirror image of the other one, right? Um, you accept that there uh, is a population uh, ramping up exponentially with a heterogeneity of time constants, i.e. the real Laplace transform of the future, okay? Um, and we've seen this again in um, uh, motor preparatory ramps uh, in uh, ALM uh, as well, and so we're really excited. Um, as an aside, the reason we know this works and we know the reflection operators because there's really simple 
uh, math that lets you compute with uh, Laplace transforms and delta functions, right? And you can, uh, we've written this down a couple times, but uh, you know, it's it's uh, a toy problem uh, to figure it out. Um, uh, is that a question, Elliot? Or, uh, or? Um, on that one, what happens if he doesn't know? Oh yeah, yeah, interesting. Oh yeah, yeah. Building a building a full featured model is really hard. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. What happens as you pass through zero? Yeah, you have to do a bunch of things. And yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. Please don't get me wrong. This is not a model for RL, right? <laughs> this is an argument though that the actions we're planning to do, and the remembered past, and perhaps also our predicted future independent of our actions could all be in Laplace uh, space. And we can just write down a simple, something that looks more like a spatial navigation model. And we worry about the bells and whistles. This is a, a call to the future of uh, some future RL, right? That, that is different. So to summarize this bit and I'll, I'll wrap up, uh, um, eligibility trace with a continuous spectrum of Lambda is the real Laplace transform of the fast, that thing we saw in entorhinal cortex. Okay, uh, and perhaps also that subpopulation in medial prefrontal cortex as well. Um, anywhere you find yourself with continuous exponential parameters, hey, see what happens if you just assume you have every possible value and you build out a line. You've now built out a supported dimension for something and we know how to compute with those and like, that's awesome. Um, preliminary data at least uh, show that there's Laplace transform of future planned actions uh, in uh, populations in at least two brain regions. Um, and this is still under, un, under in progress, but I'm pretty stoked about it. Um, and we can imagine if we really wanted to a full-fledged cognitive map uh, using uh, these operations. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say. Um, I'll, this is just concluding the whole thing. Um, and I'll acknowledge uh, you know, uh, the uh, various people who've helped uh, with all this and I'll stop to leave some formal time for questions. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, I will say that um, although we didn't, I didn't talk about it in my talk. Another thing you might do with these scale invariant representations is you might try to um, have an episodic memory, right? You might try to, as things decay. Oh, hey, remember when we came in here and you know something happened? It's as if um, the neural data and, um, and, and some sort of reasonable arguments uh, from psychology suggest that what happens is you recover a previous state of this timeline, right? Remember when I said A, right? Four times, whatever. <laughs> remember the third time I said A, right? And you go pull that uh, thing back up. Um, so again, this is kind of the same answer I gave over here. Um, in, 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 uh, in approaching real human behavior, there's a million things to work out, right? Um, the equations don't care. If you let me have an infinite precision computer, I don't care, right? Uh, if I have floating point, right? And I don't have to worry about floating point errors, I can uh, do anything. The, the, where the rubber meets the road in a realistic neural simulation or a realistic model of how actual people are actually behaving, those are really important questions that I haven't said anything about. Yeah, but I guess it's the current claim that it's essentially like strictly better. Oh, the log, yeah, if, if, if I had a population, actually, um, Randy Gallistol had a student who did a, a paper like this where he put uh, some agents into an environment uh, that had a variety of time scales, right? If the world is choosing time scales separate from you, right? Uh, and you build a system that likes one time scale a lot, performs optimally at one time scale, uh, you're gonna die, right? Because as soon as the world is a little slower than you expect, uh, or if it's a little faster than you expect, you're spending too many resources. So the, the log time scale, I think is really, really basic. And I think there's a reason why it's in the eyes and the, the cochlea, uh, the reason why the a musical, uh, why the you know, octaves are you know, doublings of one another. It's, it's a really adaptive response to the fact that the world could choose any scale, right? And so you wanna care about the relative differences between things, not the world's choice of what the time step is. Because the world doesn't have a time step, right? <laughs> 
world's continuous. Yeah. Yeah? Why do you think we have so many different thoughts in the world? Why do you think it's too yeah, I'm not, I mean, there are different clocks viewed from one perspective, right? Um, but you might imagine them as gears of one big giant clock or some, you know, handful, some much smaller than number of brain regions, much, 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 much smaller than numbers of neurons clocks, right? Um, that are, dare I say, us, <laughs> right? So yeah, the, the, the how independent these clocks are from one another, I, I wouldn't make any claim that they're independent at all, right? And they might be and they might not. Um, but I, I don't, I think the assumption that there's lots and lots of the clocks depends on what you define a clock to be, right? And it could just all be, that's us, that's one. Right. All right, thank you. Thanks again.